Greetings, my name is Ted Hicks. I am the founder, CEO, and chief investment officer for Hicks and Associates Wealth Management. Uh, we are going to start putting together um, monthly market monologues is how I'm referring to this. And the intent is to go a little bit deeper um, and a little bit more frequent. So monthly is the, uh, the goal here. If you're interested in um, some more commentary, every once in a while we will post uh, perhaps a, a little bit more of a brief content to our social media outlets. But this uh, monthly market monologue is designed to be a little bit more in depth than what we might be able to post to social media. That said, let us throw on the screen the disclosure to remind everybody that we're not giving specific recommendations today in this recording. This is also, um, it's Friday, August 27th, so this is time sensitive as well. If you have any specific questions, uh, feel free to reach out to us. You know, naturally, we would encourage you to talk to your financial advisor or, or your tax professional. If you do not have any of those, um, more than welcome to, um, you are more than welcome to reach out to me and my team. That is what we do. It would be an honor to serve you as well. We do have two offices, one in Cary, North Carolina, one in Southern Pines, North Carolina. And obviously in the new virtual world, we meet up with a lot of people all over the country in a virtual capacity. So we're more than happy to do that for you as well. Again, this uh, might you find my contact information on the screen. And again, feel free to reach out if you would like. That said, let us dive into our monthly market monologue. I could title this uh, Canaries in the Coal Mine because I see several warnings in the overall marketplace. Now, let's be clear at the outset, I am not suggesting that um, I'm being prophetic. I'm not forecasting anything. I'm just telling you what we're seeing. Um, and um, doing our best to try to explain what's happening kind of underneath the surface. Most people get their market updates, if you will, by the evening news when the evening news allocates about 10 seconds to the topic. And they'll frequently only mention the three major indexes, the S&P 500, the Dow Jones, and the NASDAQ. And usually they'll only tell you what happened that particular day. They're not going to tell you what's happened throughout the year. So let's take a look what has happened throughout um, this year. On the screen at the bottom in the green, the green line is the S&P 500. This is the 500 largest stocks in the United States as measured by Standard & Poor's. And you can see it's got a general sloping, uh, upward sloping to the line. I've drawn a red trend line on this. Um, and you'll see at the top, I've drawn a matching red trend line during the same time period on this other black line, and this trend line is going down. Now that is a divergence. Usually what we're looking for is we want to see um, two different indicators, if you will, that confirm one another. In this case, this is down, that's up, that's not confirming, that's called a divergence. So what is the black line? The black line is called the advanced decline line. The advanced decline line is the cumulative total of the number of stocks that are advancing minus the number of stocks that are declining. Now, full disclosure, this advanced decline line is on the New York Stock Exchange, those stocks, not just the S&P 500. So this advanced decline line actually includes more stocks than just the S&P 500, but that's why I drew it, because I'm trying to show that there's um, not a lot of breadth in the market. In other words, what that means is that even though the broad S&P 500 is going up, there's not a lot of stocks that are actually participating in that. A lot of people have a hard time understanding that, but the S&P 500 is cap weighted. What that means is cap, cap weighted means capitalization or the size of the company. So if there's 500 stocks in the S&P 500, it is entirely possible for the 100 largest stocks to be going up and 400 other stocks in that same index going down, but the index still goes up because if it's the largest stocks that are advancing, because of how the calculation is done, the index can still move up, and that's what we're seeing as I'm about to show you. So this is a warning. This is called a bearish divergence. Uh, if you don't remember what bulls and bears mean in the stock market, a bull market is when the stock market is going up. The way to remember that, if you need the help, is how a bull charges. A bull charges, and it rears its horns up. That's how a bull will attack. So bull market is when the market goes up. Bear market is when the market is going down. Why? A bear market is uh, referencing a bear that's attacking and they're swiping their paws down in their attack. 
That's how you remember that. So this is considered a bearish divergence. It's a warning. It's not prophetic. I'm not forecasting anything. I'm just saying this is a warning. Um, quite frequently, when we see a broader market decline, we see this in the very early stages. So this is a warning. Again, not being prophetic. Um, and I hope it is a false warning. I hope it's a false alarm. This is the junk bond uh, ETF. Junk bonds, if you're not familiar, are bonds that are issued by companies or debt issued by companies, but these are issued by companies who have a low credit score. It's the easiest way to describe it. Generally speaking, there's correlation between the junk bond market and the S&P 500 or the broad market. Uh, there's correlation there because there's higher risk in junk bonds than you might otherwise find in, for example, the investment grade bond or the United States government debt. Okay, So what I'm seeing here is since December of 2019 to today, it's a fairly flat line. Now again, there was a massive correction. That's that coronavirus correction. It's recovered, but it hasn't risen any further. Let's make this a little bit more pronounced by showing you that same data, but now we're gonna show you it alongside the S&P 500. Again, you see the S&P 500 at the bottom. It's got a trend that's generally up. You still see the correction there, but it corrected and it's rising. That did not happen. The junk bond market is not confirming the S&P 500's advance. Same data, drawn slightly differently. S&P 500 through yesterday, it's up about 20%. The junk bond market is up about 0.76%. At least that ETF is up about 0.76%. What do we typically see? Well, what we typically see is that these two um, markets and indicators are have a higher degree of correlation. In 2009, after the global financial crisis, there was I'd say tremendous correlation. Those two lines look very, very similar, okay? 2010, the very next year, again, those lines are not the same thing, but there's a lot of similarity, which is what correlation means. There's a lot of similarity between those two um, um, lines. 2011, same thing, a lot of similarity. Now, I'm obviously, I, can't, I don't have time um, to go through every single year, but what I'm trying to show is it, it's different. Right now, we're not seeing that same degree of similarity. Um, Short-term signal, let's move on. This is the S&P 500, the stocks that are in the S&P 500 that are trading above the 50-day average. This is actually good news, so everything is not bad. What this is telling us is lately, the last 50 days or so, there's been an increase in stocks that are above the 50-day average. Um, that's actually good news, but let's show you the 200-day line and the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ has more stocks than the S&P 500. That's why I'm showing this. And the 200-day line is a 200 simple moving average. That's what that stands for. So what this is trying to demonstrate is what percentage of the stocks on the NASDAQ are uh, considered to be in an uptrend. The 200-day moving average is generally considered the line that would determine whether a stock is in an uptrend or a downtrend. If the stock is trading above the moving the 200-day moving average, it is considered generally to be in an uptrend. If a stock is below the 200-day line, it is generally considered to be in a downtrend. Well, in the NASDAQ right now, or technically as of yesterday, only 38% of NASDAQ stocks are trading above the 200-day moving average. That's telling us that 38% of the NASDAQ stocks are considered to be in an uptrend. Conversely, 62% of the NASDAQ stocks as of yesterday are considered to be in a downtrend. That is not an indication of a healthy market. And if we go back, we can see this is January 25th. This is when the weakness started in the NASDAQ. And you can see it has bled into more and more companies struggling to maintain that uptrend. That is not a healthy market. Why? Um, let's talk about um, Thangum. Thangum is a kind of a made up index. It is uh, composed of six companies. That's Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google, and Microsoft. This is like the trillion dollar club. These are very, very large stocks that are traded um, in the United States. They are in the S&P 500. 
Um, and what I'm trying to show is through July 14th, there's a reason I, st I stopped this at that date because some of these stocks have kind of drifted south since then, but up through July 14th, the Fangham index, if you will, was up more than 22%. The S&P 500 was only up about 18%. That's a reasonable delta. But if you take the S&P and you subtract the Fangham stocks, that index is only up about 14% as of that date. So 22 minus 14, that's a fair amount of delta uh, or difference in those, uh, those two um, sectors, if you will, the S&P and that small subset of the trillion dollar club. Another way to look at this, this is a small caps. This is a small cap ETF. Again, not a recommendation by any stretch of the imagination, but we see uh, a trend began anew here in October and it has risen, risen, and here we are in February and you can kind of see it's just meandered sideways ever since. This is small companies, okay? Smaller companies throughout the United States. Um, they're struggling to, con to continue to advance north. That's, again, not a healthy, um, healthy thing. Now, the S&P 500 is broken down into 11 different subsectors. Uh, as an example, financials, XLF, is one sector of the S&P 500. There's 11 different sectors, and I'm just looking really quickly at how all 11 of those subsectors are doing. But what we're going to show is how healthy are those sectors and how they, do they compare to the S&P 500 overall, okay? Um, generally speaking, we want to see, um, well, we don't like to see this, but we don't like to see 5% corrections or larger, um, but a 5% correction in, a, in, the, in the stock market is fairly common. It's also fairly healthy. It's kind of like trimming your shrubs. It fosters growth. So when we see a correction, uh, if it's only 5%, that's good. It gets a little scarier when it goes beyond 5%, um, but a 5% correction is generally a healthy thing uh, for uh, uh, us to see in the stock market. Um, and on average, we would see a 5% correction in the broad indexes about every 90 days. Um, that's on average. Right now, I think we're approaching 190 days where we have not seen a 5% correction on the S&P 500. Um, so you could argue, does that mean we're about to see a 5% correction? And you could also argue, that, well, if we haven't seen a 5% correction, are we going to see an even worse correction? There's no way to know in advance. And again, I'm not trying to be prophetic. I'm just trying to explain what has been happening. So let's look at the individual sectors. This is the technology sector. And what I'd like you to see is that there's been two corrections greater than 5%. Here's a 9%, oh, let's call that a 10% correction, and here's an 8.5% correction this year in the technology space. This is real estate. There's a 6% correction here. There's a 7% correction. So, so far, two out of two sectors have experienced a more than 5% correction uh, this calendar year. This is communications. There's your 5% correction. This is uh, healthcare. There's a, approximately a 7% correction earlier this year. Um, this is financials. There's been two of these. There's an 8% and here recently a 9% correction. The consumer discretionary, you see there's a 10% correction. Um, this is uh, staples, uh, not staples, I'm sorry. This is utilities. Utilities are frequently referred to as a more stable sector of the economy. Um, you're not going to get a lot of fluctuation. That's what some people would say. Well, the data doesn't confirm that thought right now because there's a 9% correction in the utility space earlier this year, and here's another 7% correction in that sector earlier this year. This is uh, the material sector. There's an 8% and a 10% correction. This is uh, the industrial sector. Again, a 6 and a 5%. I think you're getting the idea. Here's consumer staples, six, and there's another four. Um, this is energy. There's a 12% correction, a 13%, a 20% correction, which some would consider to be a bear market in utilities. And you can see there's that red 200-day line. As I draw it, I draw it red. The red line, it's just barely recovered recently. Um, now, so each of the 11 sectors have already experienced a 5% correction. The S&P 500, however, has not, okay? Um, that's interesting that you see the S&P 500 has been in a 
uh, you know, an uptrend all year long without seeing a 5% correction yet, but each subsector has. And that's what we've been witnessing, a turnover under the surface uh, that's been a little bit more turbulent. And again, most people, uh, regardless if you're a client of ours or some, uh, a client of somebody else's or you're just managing your own money, most people are not really heavily invested in just the S&P 500. They've diversified their portfolio, which is generally considered wise. Um, and so there's some difference. Why is the S&P 500 doing this, but my portfolio might be doing that? That's part of that reason if you're seeing that in your portfolio. Now, a couple other things that will land this plane. Um, there's a lot of data on this chart, but I will just point out the top one is the consumer price index. That's how we're going to measure inflation. Um, one of the things that we have been uh, hearing from the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Chairman Powell, is that inflation, yes, it has been higher, um, but it's quote unquote transitory. It's only temporary. It will go back down. You can see here, this is the global financial crisis. Yes, you saw some higher inflation and then it corrected. Prices began to correct. Um, the concern is what if the inflation sticks around? And again, this is designed to be a relatively short video, even though I'm trying to be a little bit more in depth. I don't have time to get into that. I'm happy to explain more if you would like. Um, but here's an example of why we fear that inflation might not be just so temporary. This chart shows the job openings, the non-farm job openings. The data only goes back to the year 2000. You can see the dot-com crisis, and this gray bar is the global financial crisis. You can see each of them, you have a correction in how many jobs are posted or open, but then it meanders north. Same thing, global financial crisis. Um, here, we obviously saw a correction in the number of jobs that were available, but it has very rapidly changed, and we're at all-time highs, and that's not correcting. There's not coming back down. To me, that's a concern because what you're also seeing out there is probably anybody watching this video has seen a sign on a fast food restaurant that is offering a starting salary of $15 to start, $15 an hour to start. Now, um, we can, you know, um, get lost in that topic, but that wasn't the case 12 months ago. Um, that is, that could easily put pressure on those, for example, that fast food restaurant to increase the price of their hamburgers or whatever they're selling. Um, but it's not just in the fast food restaurants. It's just about everywhere. You're seeing more and more companies and more and more industries that are offering signing bonuses just to get people to come in and work. Um, there's, there's a lot there, obviously. It has a lot to do with COVID and think that's not the point of this video. The point is it can cause greater problems in the economy. Now, this is the last chart, and I'll land this plane. Um, Typically speaking, this is the S&P 500, and the blue bar that I'm moving at the top of the screen is just the period of time that is on the screen. And so this is what most people are used to. This is the last 15 years in the S&P 500. This over here is that global financial crisis. Um, but the point is most people just are under the impression that the S&P 500 just goes up. Every once in a while you have a correction, but it's not that bad. Well, I beg to differ. Um, actually, in the United States history, we have seen some pretty ugly scenarios. This is a 15 year period from approximately 1965 through 1979. And um, if I remember correctly, if I do the math from the start of the period to the end of the period, you get about a 2% rate of return on average if you just held that index during that time period. Now, um, a 2% on average return is what the math shows. However, that doesn't look like there's any year in this 15 year time period where you actually got an average return. It was either way above or way below. And what I'm trying to show that with this is the fact that during this 15 year time period, which actually happened here in the United States, this 15 year time period, you had four bear markets. So you could argue that it, a very scary time period if you're uh, were invested during this time. And again, I'm not trying to be prophetic, I'm not trying to forecast that this is coming. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is the theory of it's all rainbows and, and um, unicorns is that's a fallacy. We have witnessed periods like this and we could easily see that type of things happen again. Um, and so this dictates, if you will, 
uh, why we do things uh, within my firm the way that we do things. Because uh, first of all, it's all not rainbows and unicorns. And we need to know, or we believe we should know, what's going on in our clients' lives so that we can apply what we're seeing to their individual situation. Um, and this also um, helps to explain why we manage money the way that we manage money. Because these types of things can happen and we need to be prepared for um, if they should ever happen again. I hope I'm wrong. I hope I never see something like what I just showed on the screen. But if it does happen, we need to be prepared. So again, that was um, our monthly market monologue. I hope you found it helpful. If you would like to chat in more depth, by all means, feel free to reach out to me uh, or either of the two advisors that serve on my team. Again, the two offices in Cary and Southern Pines. And again, happy to meet with you virtually if you would find that um, to be valuable. So again, thank you for watching and I uh, hope you have a good day.